Wisconsin to Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Ann Thompson. Uh, I'm the Executive Vice President at Related Midwest in my day job. And I'm here tonight as the Chair of the Symposium on Contemporary French Architecture. Tonight begins uh, our second lecture in our second series of the symposium. Uh, the symposium includes three lectures, as you may know, which highlight some of the most exciting new work in France. And we're um, thrilled tonight to have with us Jamie Von Klemper from KPF, Cone Peterson Fox. I do want to take a moment um, to thank a few people before we get started. Um, first, a sincere thank you to the firms that have agreed to participate in the symposium, MVRVD, Cone Peterson Fox, and OMA. Um, I also want to thank our sponsors, Related Midwest and 210 Design House, uh, who were, whose support was instrumental in making the symposium possible. And last but not least, I want to thank Mary Ellen Connellan, the Executive Director of the Alliance, Connery Hoffman, Director of Special Programs, Amy LaBerge, Director of Programs, as well as the Board and the Women's Board of the Alliance for their support of this series. And to begin tonight, I want to take a few minutes just to, to introduce you to um, the firm Cone Peterson Fox and, uh, and talk a little bit about our speaker. Um, KPF, headquartered in New York City, is one of the world's preeminent and globally celebrated architecture firms. Since its inception in 1976, the firm has grown to a staff of over 700, led by 34 principals, with offices in London, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, Seoul, San Francisco, Singapore, and Berlin. KBF has been involved in the design of some of the world's tallest buildings, including Ping An Financial Center in Shenzhen, the Latte World Tower in Seoul, the CTF Finance Tower in Wanzhou, and the CITC Tower in Beijing. The firm's more recent high-profile projects include One Vanderbilt, a new super-tall office tower in Midtown Manhattan, as well as the master plan and design of four buildings at Hudson Yards, the largest private real estate development in U.S. history. And of course, it is hard to talk about KPF without talking about their mark in our own downtown. KPF's first design in Chicago was for 333 Wacker Drive in 1983. This design was awarded the AIA National Honor Award and made the firm nationally famous and remains today a widely loved Chicago landmark. The firm would go on to design Chicago Title and Trust in 1992, the Grant Thornton Tower in 1993, and 191 North Wacker in 2002. But equally important to the firm's innovations in tall buildings and their contributions to emerging technologies and sustainability is the firm's ability to look beyond the physical footprint of buildings to make deep, deeper contributions to the built environment. The firm has been a champion of cities across the globe by prioritizing the public realm and creating beautiful places that reflect and inspire the communities they serve. And I can certainly speak to that uh, from my own experience with the firm. Jamie and I have had the opportunity to work on a number of projects in Chicago including at our um, large master plan site known as the 78, um, as well as uh, a design for a commercial tower in the West Loop known as 725 Randolph. So tonight we have the great honor of welcoming Jamie Von Klumper, who is the president and design principal at Cone Peterson Fox. His work ranges in scale from a house to a city, and he contributes closely to these efforts from conception to completion. In addition to focusing on his own projects, he also leads the community of designers within the firm in exploring shared architectural agendas and goals. I know ma a major focus of Jamie's work has been to heighten the role that large, building play, large buildings play in making urban space. He's explored this theme in major projects throughout the world, and in each of these projects, he creates strong symbiotic relationships between program space and the public realm. Jamie has lectured across the world, including at Harvard, Columbia, Tishuan, Tangji, Seoul National, and Yonsei Universities, the ESA in Paris, AMO in Lyon, and at Yale, where he taught as a Saarinen visiting professor. Jamie is a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, and he's also a member of the Royal Institute of British Architects. And in 2018, he was awarded the American Prize for Architecture from the Chicago Athenaeum. In addition to his professional work, 
He chairs the board of directors of the Skyscraper Museum and the storefront for architect art and architecture in New York, and he is a trustee of Bard College. Please join me in welcoming Jamie on Temple. Here's the roving mic. So thank you, Anne, for the all too generous introduction. I'm not sure that was about me. Um, but uh, really, it, it is a, a great pleasure to be here uh, at the Alliance. And uh, even before <clears throat> I have anything to say here, it's just, it's, it's a great inspiration to see what this institution does, looking at your children's program, your library, uh, <clears throat> the effect on, on the whole community in Chicago. So. Uh, you know, hats off to uh, to all of you for what you do for the audience. So let me begin. I'll give you a little bit of, I'll try to keep this uh, not short, but within the 40, 45 minutes or so uh, time allotted, which is always tough because there are many stories. Every building, uh, like kind of our children, we have architects that we have kids, but we also have you know, more than a couple of kids, we have 45 children, and there are buildings, and we can go on and on forever about them. And so, um, but I want to give you a little bit of a roadmap to what I'm going to talk about, which is not only buildings in France. And they will be a feature, but just at the beginning. I want to talk, and, and Anne sort of alluded to this, about the relationship between the different scales that an architect uh, concerns themselves with, the, the macro scale of a whole city, uh, the in-between of urban design, uh, a cluster of buildings such as Hudson Yards, a single building, and then even down to uh, you know, the, the doorknob or whatever Mies, Mies van der or Walter Gropius would talk about. Um, and that's all very important, not just because we like to do everything in life, but because these relationships make the pieces more meaningful and there are problems we're trying to solve that involve a sort of holistic range of issues. So I will talk about the cities, districts and buildings. In particular, I want to take you on a tour of four districts around the world. And as Anne mentioned, we're quite a global firm. And I'll just kind of start my little stopwatch there. Um, uh, starting with uh, La Défense, which is not exactly Paris, but you know, right across the périphérique, um, And then moving on to the French concession in Shanghai and then to a part of London that was very strongly influenced, believe it or not, by the Place des Vosges, and then finally to East Midtown, New York, where the buildings that surround the new structures that we've made uh, were designed in 1910 or so by American architects, all of whom trained at the Beaux-Arts. So there's this line, this influence of French culture and French learning and French craft, etc. So uh, on the subject of of international educational exchange. Um, there's a picture of an American in Paris, uh, 1949. Happens to be my mother, who was a scholar of literature, and as she was finishing her PhD at Harvard, I think the first woman to get a PhD in literature at Harvard, um, went to spend a year in Paris. She had grown up in Paris, and there she was writing about Henry James and his interface with uh, with Zola and Maupassant and um, whatever, but you know, conveniently, she's there. Uh, one can look over the rooftops of Passy and think about a larger scope of, of architectural uh, uh, creation. And so, uh, I'll start just before we get into some projects with some watercolors that I've been working on, uh, mostly during my plane flights to Asia, when there's a lot of time. Uh, one has a lot of time in one's hands. And so this is, uh, but there's for a reason, not just because they're, they're pictures that I like to show, but because uh, as one does this kind of uh, study of uh, both the monuments of the cathedral of Saint Jean, Saint Jean, but also here's Presque Ile and the, uh, so, the Saône and the Rhone, the texture of the grain of a city, not only the, the super uh, important buildings, but the common buildings that repeat like like individual pieces of wheat in a wheat field, we learn about materials, we learn about scale, we learn about urban space, just through studying the cities and the buildings which we design when we land in a city for our work. Uh, we have to study these things carefully because we don't just we don't just helicopter in and design a building. Uh, so, or in New York to understand the texture and the scale and the building typologies of Fort Greene 
versus Manhattan or in Tokyo, uh, oops, here we go. In Tokyo, uh, Asako saw an older Meiji era part of Tokyo and then off the colored part of the drawing, a modern Tokyo, uh, or here, uh, uh, looking down uh, from the belfry of uh, Notre Dame. Um, not only uh, this uh, Ile de la Cité, part of Paris and the left bank, but in the distance also, uh, beyond Paris, coming to La Défense, which I want to talk about in a moment. So again, thinking about the amalgam of a city, and we, we think of the Turgot map of Paris of 1730 or so, uh, the, the way in which buildings of a very, very similar scale and often different uses make this kind of a network of uh, what was then uh, the greatest city, and still in many ways is, uh, in the world. And one of the greatest delineations of, of architecture and urbanism that we know. Um, but so, so this, this is Paris of, of, of a period of, uh, again, uh, mid 18th century. Um, and then we move to a layer of, now this is a Chicago favorite, the Calle uh, uh So now in Osman's Paris, all of a sudden, rather than the imprint of medieval streets, we have the great boulevards, uh, some sign of, of royal power, prerogative of, of, uh, of huge kind of bureaucratic strength of the French state that could drive these lines through the city. So just setting the stage for, after all, it was these axes that set up the, the at least the geometry of moving out to La Défense because of the, the, the grand uh, axis that, that goes all the way out Avenue, Avenue de la Grande Armée and then further on. But um, kind of a universalism of, of broad space. And some people have, art historians have said that this is representative of a kind of alienation. People under umbrellas, by themselves, not mixing together. At least that's, that's what the, uh, the art historians told me in college in, in talking about this painting. Um, that sounded like a good, a good interpretation. Um, but, but then we want to go a little further ahead. And if we say, OK, here's the Paris of, uh, this is Eugène de Rastignac, for those of you who remember your Balzac and Père Goriot. Um, and and that's, that's one sort of Parisian, uh, uh, you know, the, the boarding house of Madame Vauquet. Uh, but here, leaping way ahead to the films of Jacques Tati and Playtime, and this very modern, um, uh, almost dystopia of, uh, conceived of about the same time as uh, when La Défense was, was beginning as a, as a place of uh, planning and building and uh, a place of anonymity, of, uh, of repetition, of, of kind of featureless forms that Jacques Tati made fun of. But there was a social critique going on as well. So there is the beginning and the early construction stages of the Great Axis. And I believe the Grand Arche would be up here, the Knit, you know. And, uh, but then eventually, this dal of a raised platform, so non-Parisian in a way, but at the same time, uh, the realization of the super axis that came with Osman. Um, but I think uh, most of us understand and have for decades now uh, understood that there's something uh, really soulless about La Défense. And many people are happy working there. I shouldn't diss it completely. But uh, you know, there's a lot wanting, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the work we've been doing over about 25 years at La Défense. So here we are, the Grand Axis, which ends up again through um, the Avenue de la Grande Armée and, and coming to the uh, Arc de Triomphe, and then uh, further up towards the Louvre and the Great Arch here. So, and the Cadet we mentioned, but this. Uh, which we know as the, the, the Dal, the raised level, or the Parvis, the walking promenade. And these are some of the buildings that, that we have come to almost treat as, as opportunities to mend some of the problems that are, are there at La Défense. So this building, not our design, but something we came to about 10 years ago to the, with the assignment to take a building from the 1970s designed by Roger Sobeau and, uh, and redo the building completely. It, it has fallen into a state of being so supremely unattractive inside and outside that nobody wanted to rent it. So it's always a, a good reason to redo a building. 
But what an interesting situation. On top of, uh, believe it or not, the most uh, prosperous shopping mall in all of France, Le Quatre Temps, uh, and this building sits on top of this, separated by big neoprene pads that allow the building to move with lateral forces. So it's a separate property, one owner, another owner, and a structurally separated building. We were told you can't touch this. That's uh, Unibail Rodemco, big French developer. And this is uh, uh, a French uh, insurance company, Coupe en Main. And so from this, we made this building. And the idea was that, in a way, thematically, that this great arch, which is a kind of a proscenium, a theatrical gesture to the axis, uh, could receive as a, as a partner the curtain. So the curtain next to the stage, and um, that we would bring a, a kind of transparency and openness to the experience uh, inside the building with two great atria that were carved out inside. And they would bring green, we would bring green, this is sort of early stages before it grew in fully, to the top of that other property here. And so you can see in this diagram the kind of straight line of the axis coming from Paris towards the Grand Arch and the kind of heartbeat zigzag of that facade that ripples to sort of stop the eye, give scale to the space uh, outside and inside. Inside, a couple of major spaces that were carved out and a street that did not exist before in the plan that connected an internal street so the building could be less of a monolithic block and more of a punctuated series of auditorium, of eateries, and of walkways along this upper pavé. And so we can see inside here, and then up at the folded facade, uh, at this space, and th these photographs were taken before the building was fully outfitted, so not too many people there, but you know, in, in everyday life, this is the kind of marketplace of, of food that uh, this belongs to, is rented by large uh, French infrastructure electricity grid company. Um, and so uh, you see the kind of layering of space which we made in this uh, a redoing of the building. And uh, the kind of Pyrenaean stairways. And also a, a simple auditorium, but one that turns the tables on that big arch and looks back towards uh, the grand axis. This kind of uh, refurbishment of, of buildings is so important now for our cities because uh, for the policy of keeping the carbon footprint low, um, we simply can't afford uh, uh, environmentally to tear down and build up. And so city planners know this, and you cannot build in Paris today without a very special dispensation uh, to t if, you, if you want to take down a building. So, now, there are good reasons within Osman or even earlier Paris not to destroy the fabric, but even if there were a good reason, you just can't do it without. It's very, very strict. So our stock and trade as, as architects along with builders and city planners has to be in refurbishing the building. And that's what I'm showing you uh, in this La Défense um, uh, district work. Another project which we undertook a little before was called uh, Tour First, uh, owned by AXA, the insurance company. And it, it was, I think still is today, before the new Tour uh, Total goes up, uh, the Link project. This is the tallest building uh, in, the, in Greater Paris, in the Ile de France. And so this started its life as a quite a mundane and really dysfunctional office building with uh, three kind of uh, prongs of a three-winged form that could not relate to it. You couldn't pass from one to the other. There was a core in between. So re reviving this, but not tearing it down. And remember, when you tear a building down, you're increasing the carbon footprint of the whole project. About half the carbon that will ever be used in the building's operation is in its first build embedded of carbon in the materials of concrete and aluminum, et cetera. So saving this old building and deciding what we could do to revive it was a great, great challenge. And there's the, there's the old and then the new. And, but it's not only for aesthetic purpose that this was done. If you look at the plans, in the old plan, you 